Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Page Turners Plus. If you are joining us via IKTV in St. Vincent and the Grandines or on our Facebook and YouTube pages at Page Turners Plus, today we'll be reviewing and reflecting on Dalma Janos Figueroa's A Woman of Endurance. To tell you a bit more about the novel and the author, we have Kesua. Hello. Dalma Janos Figueroa was born in Puerto Rico and raised in New York City. She's a product of the Puerto Rican communities on both the island and in the South Bronx. She attended the New York, public, New York City public school system and received her academic qualifications from the State University of New York at Buffalo and Queens College at University of New York. As a child, she was sent to live with her grandparents in Puerto Rico, where she was induced to the culture of rural Puerto Rico, including the storytelling traditions which she brings to life for us. Moving between pre-colonial Nigeria and two vastly different plantations in Puerto Rico, A Woman of Endurance is, an imp- is a sweeping tale of one woman's journey from the edge of death to the happiest version of life, which a black enslaved woman in colonial Puerto Rico can perhaps hope for. Brimming with a cast of fully human characters, A Woman of Endurance is a novel exploring a community of enslaved people trying to survive a crime against humanity with their humanity intact. Thank you very much, Kesua. So I think we could start off where you began in your um, your description of the author in mentioning that she was born in Puerto Rico. And I guess I could ask, since this is our first novel that we were reviewing that was you know, based in Puerto Rico, did Puerto Rico look new to you through the eyes of the author? Who wants to begin? Kesua, it might be you again. <laughs> I don't mind jumping in here. Yeah, I think for me, I was really surprised at the blackness of the story she told. Um, She really brings to life a black set of people. Um, It's the way that they talk to each other. It's the stories of Africa. It's the names, you know, the Yatundes and the Yamayas and, excuse me, um, the various different recognizably kind of African-Caribbean things that we see in the story, Um, the drums. I was really surprised. I, I... it seems like an obvious thing. It's, Puerto Rico is not a part of the Caribbean, I know particularly well, um, and so the 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 way it felt so very very familiar was a real pleasure um, and and a different way of viewing what I often think of, perhaps probably mistakenly as a kind of white American space. Actually, is clearly not. And I'm sorry to all my historian Caribbean friends who were like, I should know that. I should. I should. But I intellectually did. But then that's the power of fiction, isn't it? That what you intellectually know, you kind of viscerally understand. I thought that was a real strength of the novel. Yeah, that is true. Um, because even, you know, studying Caribbean history um, many moons ago, <laughs> the, the, history, the history text in the Caribbean might dedicate a page or two to, to enslavement in Puerto Rico. And I think often we forget that Puerto Rico at one point was a plantation society and it is still to this day a colonial society. So I think that's that's one of the things that I actually um, appreciated about A Woman of Endurance, that it's actually based in Puerto Rico. It's based in the, the 19th century. And she gave us an insight into what um, plantation society and enslavement um, was like in that society, because uh, <clears throat> most of the novel takes place after emancipation in the British West Indies, um, whereas and, uh, slavery was still ongoing in Puerto Rico um, for, for a much longer period than it did in the, in, in the British West Indies. So I, I appreciated that aspect of Puerto Rico. Um, I, I do have some knowledge of you know, the demographics and, and the different um, social, how do I put it, social conditions in Puerto Rico at, at present. Uh, and we know of the political um, implications and political wranglings that go on in Puerto Rico. But I think having a backstory of how this dynamic developed was quite nice coming from this novel. Anyone else wants to get in there? Tony? Well, having said that, um, it is true that the Puerto Rican version of um, enslaved people um, at the time of enslavement across the Caribbean um, was not something that I knew of before, so I agree with that point. But what I can certainly say is that what was told was nothing new. It was a very familiar story. It was so familiar that I felt as if, um, no, it's texts that have been over, over and over and over again. And um, I didn't see anything, any new dimension 
to a typical plantation story that's being told, how the slaves were treated, how they how they interacted with the overseers and the owners and and, and the whole, you know, um, desire to escape and what happened to them when they escaped and got caught. All of those were very, very semi. Um, but as you say, it was Puerto Rico for what it's worth. Yeah. Uh, I think we could also sort of move on here because um, I think Tony raised a, a a, a good line that we could go down <laughs> and I could ask how does the way the author addresses African slavery in the Caribbean compare with the way Carol Phillips treats the subject in Cambridge and this, I think we reviewed Cambridge as our third book back in 2021 December of 2021 I think so does anyone want to, anyone want to get in there to sort of compare it with Cambridge what you um, got in this novel I think we saw more because we saw because there were more characters there were more african caribbean characters we saw more of the life of a of well what, what we imagine must be typical of of enslaved people because cambridge was an exceptional human being so you know he wasn't a field slave so we didn't get that kind of experience and also cambridge was told equally from the perspective of the white enslavers, whereas this was the story of the enslaved. We, we really didn't, it wasn't told from the perspective of, of enslavers. So that, that was a, a, a major difference. So I, I think we saw more of, we got a better picture of what the lives of enslaved people were than Cambridge gave us. And I'd add, to, I'd add to that that I think that was some of, the, sort of some of the strength of the novel as well. For me, um, you're really getting a sense of a whole community. I, I don't know if anybody else has read um, The History of Mary Prince. For me, that, that's the book that I kind of reflected on quite a lot. Have you? I, I, I've read it, but I, I, the one that it made me think of more was Oluado Equiano. I, I, because, you know, you, you see it when... Equ Equiano shows you what enslavement looked like. Um, even though he again was exceptional, um, certainly he described conditions. I know because I paid, of course, I would norm naturally pay more attention or a lot of attention to his, to his experiences in Jamaica and the hell that Jamaica was because every time he mentions Jamaica, he's, it's like he's describing hell because he's seen slavery in so many places. But whenever he goes to Jamaica, it's hell. And he always wants to get out very quickly. And the, this, this story, this story um, shows us that hell. Um, yeah. I think she also uses a term, doesn't she? Describes the, the ship as a floating hell. She has some really lovely terms of phrase in this novel that really stuck with me. And that was, that was one of them. But I, I see Casper's point in, in terms of the story being about the black community, um, maybe unlike um, Cambridge or what you mentioned, um, Paula Equiano, um, where those novels, I think, were focused on an individual. Okay? But Equiano is not a novel, but anyway. Well, well not a novel. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's his autobiography or whatever. But um, it was focused on their individual experience, right? Um, more so than this woman of endurance. All it spoke about, um, what's her name? <laughs> the, the main character. Paula. Uh, Paula. Right. All it's about her, but a lot of what was going on in the community and the other characters really took front stage um, a lot of the times. So I could see your point there, Kessel. And that's exactly how the history of Mary Prince is. On the one hand, it's it's her story, but she's constantly telling the story of other enslaved people that she encounters. She's very careful to tell a story of a community. And I think that's something that the two, obviously Mary Prince is a true story. It's, she's, it's her version of her real life. But that I think is why it's perhaps a, a like for like, not like for like, but a, a good counterpoint, because I think it's a fictionalized version of a life that I've seen vaguely before in the story of Mary Prince. Um, I also wanted to say that I don't know of any other novels that kind of treat, that kind of imagine 
the life of enslaved people who kind of are born in Africa and have a very strong sense of themselves as Africans and then die enslaved, we imagine, because of when um, abolition happens. Um, did anybody, does anybody else know any others? Because I think I, I think it's really well done. It's the story that... Well, Roots. Roots. Roots by Alex Haley. I mean, that's an obvious one. <laughs> Sorry, I meant in the Caribbean. No, no, I can't yeah. think of another Caribbean one. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree there. Um, I can't think of another one, but um, I, I suppose we could also shift because I f I like the progression of this conversation, and one thing that I really want to address was how does the author demonstrate the power dynamics of Hacienda Las Mercedes or Mercedes, sorry for my Spanish, but um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in there, but I guess I could start by saying that. It was a bit strange how it was portrayed in the novel in terms of the power dynamics. And I know that, um, you know, from reading um, actual historical accounts and historical text, you do have, you know, the different, what I would call, categories of enslaved people on the plantation who would, you know, enjoy a bit more leeway or I, I definitely wouldn't say freedom, enjoy a bit more leeway in their daily activities than others. But Something about this text, um, I, I don't know, uh, maybe I should ask the historian here because um, I, I haven't studied history for a long time. Something about the power dynamic on the plantation just seemed unrealistic. So I don't know if Kessewa wants to um, add an opinion to that or anyone on the panel for that matter. I low-key think Paul is more of a historian of slavery than I am, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I'm such a, yeah, um, but I will try. I found the opposite to be true. I actually found it a really realistic portrayal as how I, well, from the little bit I know of how power dynamics play out between people. Um, what did particularly did you find really unrealistic? Because I found that it's quite easy to imagine um, that, for example, the woman is really in charge, but the man is kind of the figurehead and he'll, he's the one that goes to the banks and asks for loans. Um, but actually the mistress is, is in charge of the day-to-day -day life because we see women have be heads of homes like that that isn't a crazy portrayal to me I, I can see that um to have a master and I'm going to start with the white people because I think that's some of the unusual portrayals most in some ways a master who imagines himself to be the good master who's kind and generous it's not like his father who was this tyrant and terrible and you know we all shudder at the memory of him you know, he's a good master and he takes great pride in that master but keeps around someone we know to be an absolute sadist right? Uh, in the form of Romero, the overseer. And he keeps him around. And at the point where someone tries to leave, the good master meets out the most terrible punishment. You know, the good master is not above the sadism, or, or, he, or applying sadism when he deems it necessary. Right? But isn't that, that is not at all un, unrealistic. No, um, that's my point. I, I think, that, right. I, I think, although uh, that's exactly my point, I think they are, it is quite realistically drawn. You know, it, it seems like it should be fiction, but it, it feels very truthful, actually. I think a lot of her, the way that she describes people, the character of Celestina, you know, you've got these kind of four black women characters who are kind of in charge of the plantation, really, in some ways. And essentially, you see them as sort of keeping it safe, as safe as they can within their power as enslaved women. And I really like the way that she places the story really in the house which we always, uh, often in representations of enslavement, the house is where the traitors live, it's where the people don't really experience enslavement. And, and she makes quite clear that there's no version of being a slave that's fun. There's no version of being a slave that is okay. There's no version, and, and they're not under any illusions of their freedom. You know, they might and have- another Go ahead, Paula. Sorry, another thing that I think when, when the, the myth of the privileged house slave um, misses is that, how slaves are nearer to the master. And if you're a woman, you're more susceptible to sexual violence. And I, I, I think in I think in many ways, um, what you just said there, Paul, um, came out quite quite strongly in this novel, um, where the ones who were in Las Agujas um, were constantly under the, the eyes of um, Doña Filo. Um, and, and and as much as as much as they, you know, were living uh, how do i put it they were not in the field let's put it that way because a, sl a slave is a slave is a slave they were not in the field they had to be under such immense pressure 
having to you know perfect their needlework um, because they're under the direct supervision of 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 these um these white masters in the house. So I so I do get your point there as well. Um, does anyone have anything else to add there? I don't know, Roger. When you were asking about the you know what was unrealistic in the power dynamics, were you were you speaking about? I immediately thought about the relationships between the slaves. I wasn't thinking so much about what was going on with the masters. I mean, I think those power dynamics were obviously as they are. But I did feel like some of the relationships between the different, I guess, groups of slaves seemed unrealistic to me, you know. In what way? Just like, I feel like, like I don't know, Celestina didn't, strike me as a very realistic character really she was the most realistic of the lot the one who thinks that she's better than the others and she's got a different outcome for life the one who chooses pain and oh no she was definitely realistic man we know her now since we're talking about celestina let me just put in here that i'm very uncomfortable with the fact that um she was a villain and i thought she was because because she is an albino and albino people have enough problems in this world i'm very very uncomfortable with the fact that we have this albino vi- villain um i mean they, they, i'm not saying the author doesn't have the right to do what she wishes to do as an artist but it because of we know the problems albino people have it really made me very worried about that yeah, I, I agree. I, I felt very uncomfortable with that depiction depiction of her. And I think that's part of the reason why I felt that whole, I don't know, just, I'm not, I, I don't know. I, I mean, at that point in time, I'm wondering, you know, would she have actually gotten to where, you know, the position that she held as an albino, would that have actually happened? But but then in the in the novel they 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 um they classified uh, Celestina as you know whiter than the whites, and I mean I, I suppose I suppose in the ignorance of the sort of pre scientific period of the nineteenth century um, that could pass. But I, I was a bit confused by that characterization in in the, the novel. no. I don't think the novel characterized her that way. I think she characterized herself that ah. way. That's how she perceived herself. Mm -hmm. And that's what she told the other enslaved people that she was. Um, I don't think it was meant to to suggest that the whites considered her um, some, some, a kind of almost unequal because she had no pigment. I don't think so at all. Um, Another thing too about the, um, about the, the villains. I thought that the villains were one dimensional. Um, Romero was just a villain, nothing redeeming about him. Um, Celestina, again, uh, the, the field slave villain, what was her name again? Leticia. Leticia. Yeah. Let- Leticia. Leticia La Mula. Let- Let- Leticia La Mula. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They, I, I thought that the villains were one dimensional. Um, we've got no backstory to suggest that this is what made them, well, of course, Let- Leticia is, is, is a field slave, um, but then there were other field slaves who were not villains. So I, I, I thought that was for me a weakness in the story that the villains were so one dimensional. I think um, Don Thomas was more of a villain than you're giving credit for. Um, I thought he was a, a really interesting villain character because was he, was there, did I understand? I thought he was, there was a suggestion that he was a pedophile. Don Not Thomas a pedophile, but he was a... No, Don Tomas well, was, was a, the, the he master. Was oh, he, he, was was master. he was a rapist, he was, but not a, a not a pedophile. Yeah, not a pedophile. I wasn't sure about the age of... Is it the fella the name of the daughter? Fela. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I wasn't sure about her age. If she, it, cause, but the suggestion was that... I would like to talk a little bit about that character because I got the impression that maybe she'd been groomed or that she was in love with him. There was a, there was a suggestion of consent in their relationship. She no. waited for him anxiously. Was that not? Fela, Fela was a new enslaved person. She was new to the plantation. Um, and, but she was broken and he took advantage of that. But then he, from the very beginning, we knew that Don Tomas was a predator. He was a sexual predator. Um, so his marriage to, to Donia Fel, uh, what was her name? Felomina? Philomena. 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 
that was a marriage of convenience. Um, so yeah, that 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 is about is about it. But but it's so interesting of of failure. I just I don't sure if any of the questions Rolji has for us will cover. I felt that there were a lot of side characters that dropped in and dropped out of the story without any kind of development, like Fela, for example, and that just kind of made everything feel very disjointed to me. I don't know if anyone else had that that impression. There were so many little vignettes that were th threaded throughout the book, which I couldn't understand like what exact purpose they were serving, or I felt that the purpose they were serving could have been done in a different way without introducing so, so many things that kind of came in and then disappeared and then were like never mentioned again. Did anyone else? But get I think that, that goes back to the beginning of the discussion when we were talking about the story of a community versus the story of, um, you know, this main character. Clearly, the novel had a main character. But um, as we said in the beginning, a lot of the um, story was told about the lives of, well, not the lives, but what, what happened with these people on, on, on this plantation. Um, so a lot of them, what you call vignettes, were, were, were people just thrown into the spotlight and thrown back out, um, I think, to complete that sort of way of telling the story about the community. Whether it worked or not, that's another um, that's debatable. Well, know. it didn't work for me. I don't know. <laughs> I, f I don't know. I found like there were certain things, for instance, um, what was her name? Adela, who worked in the house. I'm, I can't remember exactly what her role she, was. Yeah, she, she was, was one of the team Griffiths. She was one no, of the was one of, was she a scene Oh, and she was, right. She was the, um, the lady in waiting. Lady in waiting for, for Donia Fila. For, right. for Donia right. Fila, right. yes. The lady's maid. Okay. Right. So I felt like, like her, her being in the book, especially considering the really important role that she ended up playing. I don't want to give out any spoilers. Fairly, really, it was a fairly important role that she ended up playing, right, in the plot line of the book. I felt like the friendship between her and Pula, I did not see it developed. It was not developed properly. They met once. And then like a hundred pages later, suddenly they're, they, they're talking with them as friends. And I'm like, I don't get it. And I also felt the same way about the way the relationship developed between Paula and Simone. Like, we did not learn anything about Simone except from the way that he thought, uh, the way he felt about Paula. That's all we know about him. We knew nothing about his life on the plantation. Uh, just a I minute there, Kesua. I, just a minute there, Kesua. I, I see you getting very heated, but to to temper to get the temperature down in here, we're going to take the reading now. So you're going to hear from Dalma Yanos Figueroa. She'll be reading from A Woman of Endurance. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Dalma Yanos Figueroa, and I am the author of A Woman of Endurance. I would like to read a little bit. Um, from the chapter one, so um, you start right from the beginning of the story. Chapter one, Losing de Maya. Hacienda Paraíso, Piñones, Puerto Rico, November, 1849. Paula, the woman once called Kira, waits until she cannot wait any longer. Her eyes rake the clearing, the women in the cabin snore, lying motionless after a 16 hour day in the heat and sun. Across the yard, the men's cabin is dark and still. The squeak squeak of the hammock ties died down a long time ago. The overseer of Hacienda Paraíso, a man of habit has put away his whips for the night and sleeps off his latest raid on the women's quarters. La Familia, well fed and comfortable, is lulled to sleep by the song of the coquis. The smell of the patron's last cigar has long ago dissipated. With a flick of her hand, the patrona groomed and prepared for bed has dismissed her house slave. Now she's probably burrowing into her pillow, abandoning herself to her rest. 
Paula, standing absolutely motionless in the darkness, can almost see them tossing in their bedroom finery, content in their white people dreams. Snores float out of open windows all over the plantation. Lanterns sit cold. Clouds hang low in the sky, blocking out the starlight and reflections. Ola looks around the bate. Her eyes search out every shadow, every movement in the backyard. Chickens sit silently, safe in their coops. The stables are still. The occasional snort from the pigsty soon dies down. The herbs she has sprinkled in their food keep the dogs drowsy and disoriented. The night has settled into its rhythm. This time, she will make it all the way. This time, she will not be back. Welcome back. Just before we took the reading, uh, Francine dropped in something there that seemed very controversial to Kesua. So to bring us back up to speed, I'll ask, do you believe the love story between Paula and Simone was necessary or even desirable or even realistic? Kesua? You guys have hearts of stone and you need to see someone. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I believed in that love story. Okay, let's be clear. Let's be clear, right? In the midst of enslavement, in the midst of abject horror and terror and trauma, we meet Paula. Is it Paula or Paula? I'm not sure how you pronounce her name. Uh, and to be clear, she seeks her own death. And even that last desire is ripped away from her and she's brought back to life. And she's a fighter. When we meet her, she's an angry person who's experienced things that we can only imagine. We get snippets of throughout the novel. There are flashbacks to her life before the arrival on this particular plantation. Um, and what we see is is horrible. It's quite, and, and I, I, one thing I love about the novel, one thing I really love about the novel is the way that she's quite, the author is quite clear that this is a system which is brutal in horrible, terrible ways. She doesn't try and pretend it's not a terrible thing, even though the character, we want them to find peace, joy and happiness because she's a person. And I think she gets that balance right. Um, and the love story is part of that, right? I think the author is particularly sensitive to ways in which men have a unique way to hurt women. Um, and, and, and this character has been a breeder. She's been used to make new generations of enslaved people she's not been allowed to hold children she's never actually experienced a sexual relationship that wasn't violent and forced i mean this is a terrible way to live for a long time and we know that she's an adult and a long and a, and a big adult as well not just a 18 year old but a grown woman when when we meet her uh, and she introduced her introduction to simon as he tries to help her when she bites him and like draws blood, you know? And that's their first interaction. And she's gonna change and grow and realize he's actually not her enemy. He's gonna help her consistently over years. And I love that for her. I love that for us. I love that it's not a love story that's kind of forced and happens in sort of a month. You know, this is like years in the making of building a genuine trust by someone that's deeply wounded. And he's patient and he waits for her um, to be ready to seek her consent. Um, and nothing happens between them until she wants it. And that's not inc that's not unreal. Like a man that, you know, a man that is sensitive to the woman that he's interested in will do that. I don't think that's a crazy well, unrealistic thing. I, I think I he's chosen her and, and likes her fiery spirit. And unrealistic, that's what but it's highly exceptional. Um, so take that for what you. <laughs> How you want to interpret that? Uh, it's not an everyday it occurrence, um, Kesawa. Let's not run away with that. I agree. It's not. It's not. That is one in, you know, a million. A million. Right? No, I would agree. I, I'm not suggesting yeah. that this is every other man on the street, right? Right. But that's the and, kind of man he is. He's and I, and I think it's not, um, you know, a, a mystery that some people reading this novel would find it unrealistic, right? Um, because one in a million is just about the chances I have of winning the lotto here. But let's um let's bring out something else that you talk about. This woman who's deeply wounded, Paula, and does not recognize tenderness when she sees it and perhaps is afraid of it. Um, perhaps she recognizes it but wants to shut it down. Um and let's bring that to the modern context. Isn't that and y'all 
please don't chew off my head. Isn't that what the the notion of this angry black woman is today? Um, where bear me out, Keso. I see you frowning already. Where um, you 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 have women who are aggressive, seemingly, even when there are tender overtures being made, and and this is what. You know, I know Roger is going to back me up here, but I'm speaking as as the man in the panel. Where men tend to feel shut down. What's the, what's what's the reason? Why is this woman not recognizing my my tenderness? And is it because of the hurt, the generational hurt that she carries with her? Okay, that's the point I want to to throw up, lob up into the air. One word I have for that is is trauma. Um... That's all. That's all I could offer to that trauma. I don't know who wants to get in here. Well, I think that um, um, what we can see, like you said, at, like I mean, I agree with you, Tony. That that's and the the reason why Simone is great is because he understands why Pula is like that, and that's why he's decided to, you know, wait for her to be the one to decide that yes she wants to be with him because he does understand the pain and the trauma and i mean and that's excellent um and but to my pre my previous point i wasn't suggesting that the love story was unrealistic that was not at all i think obviously human beings under any conditions we want love we seek love we find love oh uh, yes that's enslaved people fell in love this happened. This is this is this is true. My point about Simon was that I felt like we did not get to know him enough. There was not enough about him in the story, what his daily life was like. The only way we knew Simon was through his thoughts mm -hmm. about Pola and his interactions with Pola. We have absolutely no information about what his daily life was like on the plantation. Where he worked in the field, but I would have liked to have more of Simone's perspective in the book of his life on the plantation, not just him thinking about how much he loves Pola and is waiting for her to come to him. <laughs> I felt that was, to me, that was, un, that, unrealistic isn't the right word. I felt that was one of the, the plot points, the plot holes in the novel, the, the weaknesses of the novel, the fact that, that, he was a really important character and we didn't I don't feel like we really got to know him properly. I, I'm I support that because not you, Francine, I support the author's choice. Um because I think that's a feminist choice, right? That you only see the man through the eyes of the woman. Like it's a reversal of the male gaze. You know, like you do get to see him and to and, and actually it does change towards the end of the novel when we discover that he can read and write in several languages, right? When we see him work in a different context, we get to explore him and we get to explore him at the point where Pola is taken seriously who he is. I think it's because it's her trajectory that we follow. We don't learn more about him until she's interested in learning about more about him. So I don't but think we it's learned so much more about other people. Because she's not safe around <laughs> men. She's not safe uh, around me. She doesn't feel secure around me. So we learn about all the different women. We learn about the three older women that are kind of like grandmother figures, um, or kind of who look after mother figures. We learn about the interactions between the women in the in the needle work office. We 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 learn so much about the space that she inhabits and the community that she lives in. But we don't learn more about any of the men until she's ready to reveal it. Until Polo's ready to engage with them. And I think that's what's happening personally. I mean, I'm not the author, but that was how I read it. But I ag I agree with you Keswa to a certain extent because I found that the first 270 something pages of the novel captured exactly what you said but then it took such a a turn in the end for me where suddenly Simone is the the, the greatest thing since sliced bread on the plantation and he gets all his desires suddenly Don Tomas realizes this is such a valuable man and he wants him to know you know I, I don't want to reveal too much but start a new industry for the plantation I don't know if I, I, I want to reveal this but there's a marriage and a huge celebration and I found in the end Simone won more than Paula did and and that's an issue that I had where you dedicate such a huge chunk of the novel to sort of showing the the feminine power of, of, of you know, or so, so showing woman power and dedicating so much of the novel to the experiences of women. And then the ending just sort of 
sort of fell flat and suddenly a man is winning. Look at what he lost to win what he won, though, right? Because actually, he lost a lot because of Polar, right? He lost so much of what had been important or what had made him valuable prior because of Polar. And he lost that because of, well, Romero primarily, but because Romero was looking for Paula, right? And so even when he wins, and I think it's really, I think, and this is what I think is magical in this novel, I'll say it, magical, is that um, Polo is only able really to see, to, to engage with him, to really trust him in some ways when he is physically un- incapable of, of dominating her. That is the point at which she's ready to kind of engage with him fully and 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 she's and she's safe around him because she knows he can't so, do anything so you see as a man I, I, I find that a little disturbing as a man because uh, if, as a woman if, i agree with you that if, i find that if that's that what a man has to go true. through to finally win a woman's love then if that's the brand of feminism or that's what feminism is about well it ain't going nowhere with me um you, you what is this i mean a, it's a not about. Must... It's not about. It's not about all women. Yeah, all the yeah, time. But, it's but, about this particular look at the ex, woman look at and what the she has experienced. No, I, I this think, man I think almost he's... lost his life, and and still, even then, she wasn't being convinced. You know. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Tony because disturbing. I feel like there was so much else that he did to demonstrate that he was not a threat. You know. Bef- why did it have to come why did it have to come to the point where he was completely physically incapable of harming her for her to suddenly realize it he became a pet he he, de- he demonstrated he end, over you know? and over that he was not a threat to her and he was here to help her helped her with the most important thing she had found at the plantation like liver and yet she was still but that speaks to her level. But of that's trauma. trauma. That's trauma. Yeah, that's yeah trauma. I get that it's trauma. I get, I get it. It's yeah. But still, I can understand her still, having Paul, that, that reaction. Wait, no, that's, that's, trauma. Trauma. That's, that's trauma. Reaction. You know what I find interesting that, that reaction is that we can just Romero, justify... her, her, that reaction to Romero. Hmm. I get it. What I find but interesting, Kessel, is that we could justify trauma when it relates to a woman's trauma, but. The men, and that's Francine was saying. I no, but that's know. how trauma yeah. works, Tony. You don't yeah, think. But, but, but these guys are traumatized as well. And that's part of the reason why um, the, what, so, so the men are living on the plantation without um, being traumatized. Not be, not, they're not raped, I suppose, or they're not whatever, but give me a break. Um, men have their, no, their share no, I don't understand. No, I don't understand what the objection is here, Tony. Because I, a, a traumatized person does not. I mean, if you if you've experienced trauma, and I've experienced lots of trauma, so maybe maybe I should speak personally. You don't think, um, well, this person is different. You don't. That's not how your mind works. That's but that's not how. That's not I, what trauma does that. to you. No, but I hear that. But what I'm saying, I mean, I think Francine said we did not find out enough about his life and to understand how or if he was traumatized. I'm sure he was, like any slave. No, but then, as I, Kessel was said, this is a woman-centered novel. No, I am not agreeing with Kessel. Um, with Kessel's take on. On well, what I thought was Kessler's take on um, know that he is physically incapable of harming her. I I think that's toxic feminism, Kessler. If that is your feminism, you and I are going to fall out because that's toxic. Um, <laughs> but um, I I don't see the I don't see the difficulty in understanding that somebody who has experienced intense trauma can trust no one, no matter how kind they are. And you're on mute, Tony, but so while, while you are, I'll take advantage of saying, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that a man has to be incapacitated for a woman to be able to trust him. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying Paula, because of the level of like harm that she has experienced prior to us meeting her, because of what she has been through, she is, not physically, that's not the right word, emotionally stunted. And I think what's really important to remember about the novel is as well, is that she does her like I said, her, her and Simone don't get together on day three of her day on the on the arrival at the new plantation, huh? Like she has to do a lot of work on herself. She has to trust the other women 
she has to trust lots and uh, lots and lots of other people before she gets anywhere near to having a a, a, a human contact with him. So I think the the I think that's the journey that she goes on, like that she has to. I think they even kind of d- describe it as a bit of a religious experience. She has to kind of heal. And right at the beginning, we hear your body is healed now, but now you have to work on your spirit. And I think that's a real challenge that the novel poses to us. What is the damage that is done mentally and psychologically and spiritually that we still haven't figured out? And she's not the first, the author isn't the first to raise that question, right? But I think she does it in this novel, what, what we all talk about, this kind of intergenerational trauma, which isn't generational for her because it's one life. It's the life that she has lived that has traumatised the hell out of her. And that is why she can't have a relationship with Simon that is is reciprocal of his feelings until she's ready. And he's he sees that from very early on. And he's willing to wait because he thinks she's worth it for whatever reason, because he sees things that we don't see for a long time. Um, and, but I think, Tony, because of his own trauma, as you said, because we do find out about his wife and child before and how he ended up on the plantation. And because he's seen how his previous wife died, he sees a little bit of that in in Poland, and we can talk about whether that's even healthy, right? He's like yeah, oh, I mean, another warrior. He's an exceptional man. But 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 before you um, count us out, Roger, I realize the time is ticking down. That and I, I'm not hoping I'm not spoiling it. But as we're talking about this, what I call a fairy tale ending, um, the the guess what? You are such a romantic man, you know. <laughs> but the fairy tale ending. Um, what disturbed me about it, what I didn't like about it, is how the owners of the plantation just just virtually let off the hook. It's almost as if they sanctioned in the end, they gave it their blessing. You know, these people gave it their blessing, and so all was well. And that just angered me. That just like, what the hell, you know? Um, Why angered? The people who presided <laughs> over all this evil and all this same stuff that Paula herself had to endure and, and, and so on became like, oh, we love this. You know, it's such a wonderful life for you two to go off into the sunset. That look, um yeah, I, somebody somebody else better, that fairy on. tale ending, I was like, what? No freaking way. Oh I yeah, so I was very unhappy with the fairy tale. On describing okay. the clothing, and like as though this was like the, the 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 apex, you know, her her life now her life is perfect because she has all this beautiful clothing to wear. Did the, you know, and all the descriptions of the wonder, the feast, and the no. And she got her head. It's done. a good. And she got. I was. It's a good thing. I was. Re, I was reading on my Kindle, and I love my Kindle, yeah. so I didn't throw the book I'm, across the room. But I was like, I am. I was like, is the, is this a, is this a fairy tale? This is not a fairy tale. They lived and they lived happily ever after, in a book about enslaved people. I'm sorry, but no. <laughs> yep, I had the same difficulty. Um, I I am very uncomfortable with a fairy tale ending for a book about enslaved people. They're, these are not people who are going to be free anytime soon. And because they are allowed to marry, which is not unusual in the Spanish speaking um, Americas, by the way, or, or in the Portuguese speaking Americas, that's not unusual. Um, but the fact uh, they're, they're suddenly, everything is wonderful. No, no. I, I agree fully there, and I think I could take those comments as our final thoughts on the novel, and that those comments are also my final thoughts. I was I was quite surprised at the end of the novel. Kessie, with five seconds, say it. <laughs> no, you have nothing to say? Okay. So yes, those are the final thoughts. Those are my final thoughts. Thank you for joining us. This has been our Reflections on A Woman of Endurance by Dalma Janos Figueroa. The next time you see some of us, we'll be interviewing the author of this novel. Thank you for joining us. Have a lovely day.